In May of 2021, I took it upon myself to, for the first time in my life, read George Orwell's 1984. I bought the book on a whim at an airport to pass the time while waiting for a heavily delayed layover flight. The book's content was, to be brief, profound to the point of being life-altering, but reading the book in May of 2021 in an airport was, to say the least, a terrifyingly eerie experience. Normally, I would have immediately jumped into a review of the book as part of my Mike Reads Reviews series, but the content of the book and the context in which I was reading it demand a much more thought-out and thorough review than I normally do, and requires rereading the book, taking lengthy notes, and scripting out and editing a more formal review, much in the style of this one. I'll be releasing that video, hopefully, in a few weeks, so stay tuned. In the meantime, I came about a bit of an epiphany when it came to the character of Syme while I was in the midst of my rereading last week. The realization I had is something I don't think anyone's ever brought up, or at least not that I can tell, and I find it somewhat revealing, so I thought I'd put together a separate video to explain my finding. Before we get started, I need to get out of the way that my realization requires reading fairly deeply into the content of the book, and, to be honest, I may be reading a bit too much into the book, right to the edge of being a creepypasta. So if you think I'm going a bit far, feel free to roast me in the comments section. I'll also add that my realization is just an element of the themes of the book, and not in any way something that should be regarded as the primary lesson or takeaway from the book's themes. For the sake of concision, I've put together this piece assuming the viewer has read the book, so if you haven't read it, do that first, and fair warning, spoilers abound. 1984 is, at a very surface level, a critique of the kind of socialism and communism taking place in the Soviet Union of Orwell's time, in a similar vein to his prior work, Animal Farm. But where Orwell's critique of Soviet-style communism and Animal Farm was a clear and straightforward allegory for why what was happening in the moment in the USSR was bad, 1984 was much more of a how and why things got to that point, or, more importantly, could get to that point, than a direct criticism necessarily of central planning. In fact, I would argue at its core, the two parts into which 1984 is bifurcated could be titled 1984 How and 1984 Why. But in stark contrast to Animal Farm, the Soviet allegories in 1984 were only very much surface level, and the root of the story was much more an insight into language. At its root, language and memory, from an evolutionary standpoint, are so causally linked that they may well be considered one and the same. In fact, your inner dialogue isn't just related to language, it isn't just an element of language, it plainly is language manifest. I'll put a link in this video's description to a piece on language put together by Radiolab that goes into far greater detail on the science behind language and its development than I can here. In brief, the piece shows that language is itself inextricably linked to essentialism. It shows how there is more to the word chair than its tangible, atomized definition, which allows children to know what constitutes a chair and what doesn't the moment their parents point to one and say, chair. A child learning the word chair, by definition, is a child learning that throne, lazy boy, and the rolling computer chair are all chairs but that couch, bed, and toilet are not chairs, even though they might exhibit a great many shared characteristics. Children learn this without even having to be told by merely making the connection between the word chair and a chair. In the mind, there is no difference between the word chair and the essential characteristics that make a chair a chair. In short, there is more to a chair than the subatomic particles and their arrangement that make a chair a chair and humans instinctively make that connection through language. By contrast, artificial intelligence lacks this conscious ability and, as such, lacks the ability to resolve the Chinese room problem in a way even young children instinctively can. There is a subset of politic that rejects essentialism, that there is no greater meaning for anything other than what is tangible, measurable, or limited to the exclusively sensory realm. This is the type of worldview that has a difficult time answering questions like, what was it like? Instead, responding with questions like, do you mean how tall was it? Do you mean what did it taste like? Do you mean how painful was it? 
Orwell spends a great deal of 1984, in essence, arguing for essentialism and showing that it is the politic which seeks to destroy essentialism that leads to the world of 1984 through its destruction of language. And this is where the character of Syme comes into play. On the first read-through, I considered him the most interesting character in the book, but it wasn't until my second reading that I really understood why this utterly disposable character so attracted my attention. One of my greatest criticisms of 1984 was how on the nose so much of the book was, how much failure Oral displayed in showing me versus telling me. No other character could be considered more on the nose than Syme. His character acts as nothing more than a convenient mouthpiece to hammer through exposition in the same way that a newsbeat in a TV show would. As far as a literary work, had Orwell been creative enough to elicit that same information without just saying it and, instead, allow the reader to infer that information from context, it would have made for better writing. We can even see how discardable Syme's character is in his introduction. It was his friend, Syme, who worked in the research department. Perhaps friend was not exactly the right word. You did not have friends nowadays. You had comrades. But there were some comrades whose society was pleasanter than others. Here again, Orwell is subtly making the case for essentialism, because there's more to being a friend than just merely being comrades whose society was pleasanter than others, and which goes beyond a tangible definition. In this way, as well, Orwell is showing that the character within the story is disposable. He is not inextricably linked to the main character and is, therefore, not inextricably linked to the story. He is nothing more than a convenient plot device, a contrivance of exposition. Syme's role as mere on-the-nose expositor is probably best exemplified in his Destruction of Language speech in Part 1, Chapter 4. As one of the key purposes of Orwell's work was to argue in favor of essentialism and to show the connection between language and the mind itself, Syme conveniently explicitly says so. You think, dare I say, that our chief job is inventing new words, but not a bit of it. We're destroying words, scores of them, hundreds of them every day. We're cutting the language down to the bone. It's a beautiful thing, the destruction of words. Syme then goes on to describe how a word and its antonym could be reduced to a single word modified by an un prefix, and that there would be no need for synonyms. The speech continues for several pages, but with this speech, Orwell is simply stating plainly his case for essentialism and his case for exactly how control of language is control of the mind. The whole speech is Orwell arguing through the mouth of Syme and beating the reader over the head with it. He might as well just have included the content in the book's narration. Syme even lays out the Chinese room problem when talking to Winston. Even when you write it, you're still thinking in old speak. I've read some of those pieces you write in the Times occasionally. They're good enough, but they're just translations. Syme even goes so far as to say, quote, Even now, of course, there's no need for committing thought crime. It's merely a question of self-discipline, reality control, end quote. It's Orwell's way of arguing undeniably that the party is manipulating language as a means of mind control. We would read later that the party sees no difference between the perception of reality in the mind and reality itself, and that, ipso facto, control of language is not only control of the mind, but control of reality. I said previously that part one and part two could simply be titled 1984 How and 1984 Why, respectively. In part one, Syme explains how the mind could be controlled by merely having total control of language, and O'Brien would later explain why. Quote, the party seeks power entirely for its own sake. End quote. At the end of Syme's speech to Winston in the aforementioned Part 1, Chapter 4, Syme reduces the whole of his speech to the straightforward, on the nose lesson of exactly how this would all unfold and in no uncertain terms. How can you have a slogan like freedom is slavery when the concept of freedom has been abolished? The whole climate of thought will be different. In fact, there will be no thought as we understand it now. Orthodoxy means not thinking, not needing to think. Orthodoxy is unconsciousness. This is just narration in quotes. Syme is, here, proved a throwaway character whose purpose is to tell, not show. He has, with this final line, 
revealed the literary weakness of the inclusion of his character. The thing is, the story is self-aware of Syme's weakness as a character. The paragraph immediately following Syme's orthodoxy is unconsciousness goes as follows, quote, One of these days, thought Winston with sudden deep conviction, Syme will be vaporized. He is too intelligent. He sees too clearly and speaks too plainly, end quote. It's as though the book itself acknowledges that Syme is a weak character and that using him in this manner is a literary weakness. Orwell, as a writer, ought to dispose of this type of character and this type of exposition, and it appears he knows it, as the next sentence makes undeniably clear. Quote, the party does not like such people. One day he will disappear. It is written in his face. End quote. But who, then, is the party in this case? Where exactly is it written, if not right here in this sentence? If Syme only exists in the physical ink and paper of 1984, then his face only exists in that same physical ink and paper. If Orwell and the party in this sentence are reduced to their atomized elements, and all of the essence of what characterizes the two are stripped, what is the difference between Orwell as the narrator and in this instance, the party. As though to make the point even more clear, just a moment later, Winston notices a person speaking at a nearby table. But what this unnamed character is saying isn't meaningful conversation, but regurgitated talking points of the party. Quote, It was not the man's brain that was speaking, it was his larynx. The stuff that was coming out of him consisted of words, but it was not speech in the true sense. It was a noise uttered in unconsciousness, like the quacking of a duck, end quote. Just two sentences after Winston makes this realization, Syme rather conveniently says, There's a word in Newspeak. I don't know whether you know it. Duck speak. To quack like a duck. It's one of those interesting words that have two contradictory meanings. Applied to an opponent, it is abuse. Applied to someone you agree with, it is praise. This is just too convenient. How could Syme possibly know that this was the thing he should say? How is it that Syme conveniently knows then and there to tell Winston there is a word for what he is thinking, and that it conveniently lines up with how Winston is characterizing the thing? Orwell would have nearly been better off just leaving this in narration, and you couldn't possibly get a better example of Syme's literary weakness as a character. Unsurprisingly, Orwell here notices the need to extricate the character from the story, as the next sentence immediately following Syme's duck-speak explanation goes, quote, Unquestionably, Syme will be vaporized, end quote. Here is where my revelation comes finally to light. Winston's knowledge that Syme will be vaporized is Orwell saying that his character in the book was just a convenient mouthpiece, a literary cheat so on the nose that it was obvious it would be cast aside and discarded, and that it must be to preserve the integrity of the story. The physical book itself here becomes part of its own story. The story is Big Brother and the Destruction of Language, and the physical book, or the story by another name, is Big Brother and the Destruction of Language. It isn't just Big Brother that is going to vaporize Syme, but Orwell himself. Orwell is Big Brother, or more accurately, the story is Big Brother, and the conveyance to the reader of what is happening is the story of Winston. In this way, Winston is the reader, and the story being told is Winston being controlled by Big Brother. Ipso facto, it is the reader who is being controlled by Big Brother, which is synonymous with the story itself. There is a dual role being played by the story, and that duality can't exist without unconsciously accepting that there are essential characteristics that allow this dual role to exist. It represents a metaphysical conversation you can't have if you destroy essentialism, which harkens back to what Syme was saying about language. This is all later supported by O'Brien's how versus why speech. How could O'Brien possibly know what Winston was thinking? Because we... The reader know what Winston is thinking. We are Winston, but it's Orwell, or rather the book, both its content and the literal ink on paper, that is telling us what Winston is thinking. The book itself is Big Brother.
and O'Brien is just its mouthpiece, giving us the why to Symes' how. In this way, the book controls the mind by telling us what to think by way of what is happening in the story. The world of 1984 exists entirely in the mind and is entirely limited by what the story gives us of that world. Upon its completion, the reader has no choice but to accept the reality of the story being dictated to us. We can't possibly have the complete story of 1984 without literally completing the story of 1984. And there's no information about 1984 which isn't explicitly given to us by the literal ink and paper of the book. That which the book tells us is true in 1984 is true in 1984, no matter how factually untrue it might be if it didn't live in this book and in this world. In the end, Winston accepts his fate and genuinely believes about the world of 1984, what Big Brother tells Winston is true, and, as an allegory, so does the reader. The final sentences of the book make this point clear. Quote, But it was all right. Everything was right. The struggle was finished. He had won the victory over himself. He loved Big Brother. End quote. It isn't a coincidence that Orwell placed Big Brother off in the ether, a mysterious character somehow controlling the whole of reality. It's also not a coincidence that what little we get in terms of a physical description could actually be used to describe Orwell himself. Regardless, you cannot make that connection without also accepting essentialism, because the connection requires accepting that there is meaning within the story beyond the literal interpretation of the words used. To even have the conversation in the abstract, the mind requires accepting essentialism, as there exists no words with which to have the conversation which don't already accept essentialism's existence. And this is what Symes' character represents. He is, at face value, a fairly weak character who could easily have been discarded and whose words could easily have been copy and pasted into the narration. But they weren't. So why did Orwell include him? Why even have this character? What is his purpose? His purpose is to expose the how and to unknowingly make the argument for essentialism. But looking just a little bit further... His purpose is to show the how and to unknowingly make Orwell's argument for essentialism. Syme is on the nose because his character has to be, in the same way he has to immediately then be discarded. Syme's character and his immediate disposal exist to allow the reader to make the connection between the story being told and Big Brother. That the book itself is Big Brother.